presentation after eating such a wonderful lunch. Because a lot of times it's like, okay, after you eat a lunch like that, you just want to just kind of take a walk or take a Go nap sleep, yeah. or do something else. So I do appreciate you coming to this presentation. My name is Marilyn Easter. I'm from San Jose State University. I teach in the College of Business. Carol? And um, my name is Carol Easter. I teach at Chabot College in Hayward, California. Uh, I am a digital media instructor. Okay, you want to yeah. turn that? Okay. So it's, it's, it's really wonderful for me to be the professor who's been teaching for 35 years. And I'm teaching my daughter. This is my daughter, Carol. She's brand new. Yeah, this is my daughter. So when they say the forward and the reflect reflective approach, which one do you think is the forward? Which one do you think is the reflective? OK, you don't have to say that out loud, OK? But it, it, it gives me such pleasure to be able to talk about the way that education is changing. The changing landscape of education is uh, it's like, um, our speaker this morning, I was very impressed with Paul uh, Marcus' presentation, and he talked about the, the disruption in education. Well, let me tell you something. My teaching has been disrupted, big time. And I say this is because Paul talked about the macro aspect of education and how the whole environment is changing. What we're going to be doing is talk about the uh, the micro, and that's what's happening in the classroom. So what we'll be talking about is the changing la landscape from my perspective as a professor teaching for the last 35 years. We will give you a background of the students at San Jose State University and how we interact with them, again, from a, a micro perspective. And we will talk about the, the course redesign. After teaching for so many years, I learned that I had to change with the times. My teaching was disrupted, not because I wanted it to, but I had to change because the students changed over the years. So, and Carol will be giving you some examples of what's happening in the classroom today as she sees it. So we have a millennial's point of view as far as what's going on in the classroom, and you, we have a baby boomer's point of view in terms of what I've experienced in the classroom for so many years and what I'm experiencing now, but I got to think like a millennial to survive as a baby boomer teaching technology with today's students. So students at San Jose State have changed dramat dramatically from the time I started teaching. I used to walk in a classroom and I would, let me just go back just for a moment. Um, I was the lady standing right there, as you can see, with the, with the whiteboard. Well, it's, it was actually a chalkboard. I would go to class every single week, once a week for two hours and 35 minutes. I would teach my students. And then I wouldn't see them again for another week. And I said, I've done my job. Well done. I didn't see these students for an entire week. Now, I thought it was OK, because I didn't see them. They'll see me the following week. I can tell them if they passed an exam or if they failed an exam. I can tell them what they missed if they weren't there the week before. That worked way back then. That does not work now. Mm -hmm. Students expect to get information literally 24-7. Technology is ubiquitous. My students are, are literally, I have students right now at San Jose State University, I'm teaching a class while I'm here in Bangkok, and my students expect for me to be there for them. And they know that they can connect with me 24-7. So in order for me to move forward so that I can catch up with the uh, millennials, I have to make sure that I meet my students where they are right now. And they want me 24-7, so I have to make, make them feel, not physically that I'm there, but they have to experience and think and uh, just feel like I'm there for them 24-7. I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So to give you a perspective of the students that I deal with, first of all, 
San Jose State University has about 33,000 students. We're a commuter campus. We have eight colleges on campus. I'm in the College of Business, and I teach specifically for the College of Business. The classes that I teach vary, but the particular class that I'll be talking about today is a marketing course. In this particular marketing course, students must be a junior or better, or some of our students, they've been in school for the last six, seven, eight years. And as, uh, as Dr. Marka talked about, we're talking about learning for 40, 50, 60 yeah. years. Is it, that's what it's, uh, what it's about. Well, I'll tell you, at San Jose State University, if you can't get out in five years, they're going to tell you, you got to go. So the students are going to have to keep learning, but the number one thing is that I was experiencing something very differently in my courses uh, within the last few years that I didn't really think about. My students were not passing my class. Now I said, now why is it, it used to be my students would pass my course, not a problem. But all of a sudden, I noticed for a few years, students weren't passing. And then I realized that we have students that are commuters, they're commuting to campus. About 95 of our students are commuting to campus. They're working full-time or part-time. Now let's talk about something. If they're working full-time, when does education start? If they're working full-time, when do they have time to come to the classroom? So I realized we got a problem here. The students that are working part-time, they're super busy doing a bunch of different things. And then I found that there were students taking care of their parents. They're taking care of their friends, their families. And I'm saying, wait a minute. If students are so inundated with juggling their jobs, taking care of mom, taking care of dad, or grandpa, grandma. I've heard all kinds of things where students said, hey, I'm taking care of my family, so I can't do the work, Dr. Easter. And I said, okay, I get that. I understand if you're taking care of family, but you're in school. So when are you gonna have time for school? And then I said, well, if you're taking care of your family and you're doing all these things, and you're having a tough time with technology, I have a problem as a professor. So when I was teaching my courses, I had to stop right there and I had to think about, I had to change what I was doing in the classroom, otherwise my students would continue to fail. The other thing that I, I found out, 41% of the students in the CSU system, that's the California State University system, are they have food insecurities. Now you say, well, what's food insecurities? What does that mean? Well, these students have to choose. Am I going to eat or am I going to buy your textbook, Dr. Easter? And I said, you know, there were many students that said, I, you know, I'm sorry, but I, I couldn't study for the test because I did not have a textbook. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, well, how did you get along so far? in the class without a textbook. Well, they go to the library, they borrow a book if there's a book available, they, uh, they copy notes, or they just hope that by some divine intervention, they'll be able to pass a test without reading the textbook. So I said, I really, I, as a professor, I have a serious problem on my hands. So I said I needed to connect with the right people somewhere uh, within the, within the, uh, the California State University system so that I could figure out a way to just redesign my course. And what I mean by redesigning my course, I just couldn't teach my course the normal way, just, you know, like I used to. The students come and they see me, and we, I can lecture for an hour, because I can talk, okay? I can talk for three or four hours, and, and I'm still happy. And the students are asleep, but I'm still talking. Well, let me say this. I realized that I couldn't do this anymore. I, I, I realized that I had to meet the demands of the changing population. So what did I do next? I said, okay, let me think about how the talented students that I have 
Students at San Jose State, they come from around the world. If, if, if I, you know, here in Bangkok, I feel that I see a lot of San Jose State right here in Bangkok in terms of being wonderfully diverse. So with the diversity, I realize that talent is equally distributed in society, but opportunity is not. So what could I do to give students the opportunity to showcase literally showcase their talents. I had to change everything that I was doing in the classroom. So again, I'm speaking from a micro point of view what I've done in the classroom. Now, let me just say this. I decided to redesign my course. To, to redesign my course, it simply means this. Everything that I knew in the past, I had to literally throw it away and start from the ground up. So I had to build my course literally ground zero, and I had to say, okay, now we got to have the students in mind. Who are the students? I know that my students are not buying the textbooks. I know that my students do not have time to really read or do a lot of things that's highly structured. So I knew I had to have my class available to the students literally 24-7. And I decided, well, let me go in and try to do this. Even though I'm a baby boomer, I have to think like a millennial. So I would ask my daughter, I said, OK, from a perspective of, of a millennial, how do you think um, I should set my course up? So I wanted to have a student perspective, even though she's not a student. But because she's my daughter, I have to, you know, in the same age range as my students, I started thinking, how can I change based on on the student perspective, but then I started thinking about the bottlenecks. Now, right here, it says decrease bottlenecks. Well, here's the deal. If the students are not passing the class, then they have to take my class over again. The ones that have yet to take my class, they want to register in my class, and they're the first ones to get in the class, but the students that are repeating my course, they're going to have to wait. So the, the university is set that you must graduate by a certain time frame. And the problem is, it's a, it's a conflict of interest here. It's because we want our students to graduate, but if there's a bottleneck where everyone's trying to get into my class and they can't get in the class, what's going to happen? It's like being in a, an intersection and you're trying to figure out who's going to go first and then, or whatever, but the students that get in the class are the ones that have never taken the class. And so I wanted to decrease that, and I wanted to open the class to more people. Um, make learning affordable. Now, that's the, key, the operative word, affordable. How could I do that? I decided I need to talk with the people at San Jose, not only at San Jose State University, but at the chancellor level. Uh, Dr. Hanley was the person that I had gone to, and you're going to hear from him in just a few moments. And so uh, I wanted to create more engagement, because if students are coming to class and they're tired, they're hungry, they, a lot of things are going on in their heads, how can a professor teach the way that I used to teach and keep students engaged or to get them engaged? if they have all this other stuff going on. So again, changing the way that I, I, I had to design my class in a way that it was going to be palatable for any student to come in, especially the free. Now, remember the word free, and, and because I'm going to talk about it quite a bit. You guys like the word free? Yeah. Well, I have something free for you at the very end of this presentation, OK? Just to <laughs> let you know that I really believe in the word is called what? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really like that. Everybody likes what? Free. Right on. OK. Uh, and also to, to encourage active learning. Now, it's one thing to learn, but how do you measure active learning? Mm -hmm. And so I had to think about that. How do you get students engaged and then yet give them something free? And even you give them something free, how do you get students excited about opening a textbook that is what? Free. Free. OK, you guys. I wanted to just see if you're paying attention. OK, so customizing the class for the learner. So it used to be 
I would get a textbook, uh, the department chair or someone say, okay, you're going to teach marketing. Here's a textbook. Go teach the class. That doesn't work anymore. Now it's backwards. It's like, who are my students? I look at the demographics. I look at the psychographics. And then I said, okay, these are the learners. I know what the content is. I'm a content expert. So I know exactly what I should be giving them, but I have to be able to align the content so that students really understand and they get the materials. Okay, so here's the wonderful team that I worked with at the California State University. Uh, they're the course redesign. I was literally afraid to take my course and everything that I knew, I literally had to toss it, get rid of it, and I had to start ground up. Now that's a little intimidating, but because we have a lot of wonderful people within our in, uh, educational institution system-wide, and when I say system-wide, we have 23 uh, university campuses throughout the state of California. This team right here worked with every campus throughout California. So they took the time with just me, by myself, to help me redesign my course so that I can increase student engagement, get students to graduate the whole nine yards. Okay, so let's hear from Jerry Hanley. He is the uh, vice president, uh, excuse me, the, the assistant vice chancellor for uh, technology. Hi, my name is Jerry Hanley. I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Technology at the California State University System. It's my pleasure today to talk to you about the Affordable Learning Solutions, the CSU's major initiative to reduce the cost of course materials for our students. And we're doing that in a variety of ways. We're partnering with our bookstores to work with uh, our publishers to provide students digital versions at significant reductions in cost, up to 60% off or more for digital versions. We're also working very closely with our libraries to provide our students free e-journals and free e-textbooks for their courses that really provide high quality materials from many traditional publishers and we're also using open educational resources that are free for students for cost and free for faculty to edit those versions to ensure that you have quality course materials for our wonderful courses. Thank you and enjoy the website and learn as much as you want about affordable learning solutions. And um, as uh, Dr. Hanley said, um, we do have a lot of um, open educational resources that are available through the CSU system. Um, so when we say open, it's free of cost and it's uh, something that there's no barrier to entry. So you'll be able to go ahead and uh, go through all the materials that are available for you. Um, they're Creative Commons, so that will be uh, able to be used and modified to your own context. If you find a textbook that's available to you um, through uh, some of these learning resources that we're going to show today, um, you'll be able to modify them for your classes um, as well as use entire class structures um, if you'd like to. And these type of things are gonna be available 24 seven for your students. Um, I found a lot of success making sure that I have available resources for my students 24 seven because if they're on the phone, uh, they can actually look up their textbook, they can use their phone on the textbook, or sorry, they can use your textbook on the phone or say for instance, um, I create YouTube videos for my students as well, uh, which they can review at any time, whether they're in my class or outside of my class. Um, so that's something that's very, very good. Um, you'll also see that there's open access journals and peer-to-peer -peer relationships that you can actually create and build with other professors, no matter what discipline. And all of these are going to be available for you in the Cool 4 Ed. So California Open Online, um, Open Online Library for Education. Just like any library, you should be able to go through this as a resource 
and find your course on that bookshelf. Uh, you'll be able to use even Marlowe, uh, which is incorporated within that system, so you can uh, create and build better courses for your students. Uh, beh behind me or over here, uh, you'll find that this is going to be a scroll. Um, it's just going through how the website looks. Um, with this, you'll see that there's peer-to-peer -peer, um, reviews. You'll be able to find other courses and textbooks created by other individuals, and there have been a lot of success stories in that. Um, you'll also be able to find textbooks by ISBN number. So if it's not free, uh, they have similar ones that can be free for your uh, students that you can use. Um, and this will also allow you to um, sort by discipline um, as well as reach out to other faculty members if you'd like to around the world. And then within Merlot, let me just move over to the internet. Right there. there we go. Okay, with Merlot, say, well, what is Merlot? Merlot is a um, is a um, is a website where you can actually go to get access, literally, to all sorts of materials. It is a, a, a place in which you can create your own materials. You can actually get materials. You can do a lot, of, you can build your own class. You can do a lot of different things. And so let me just say this. When I had to build my class, the first thing the CSU system told me I had to do, they said, well, you need to uh, join Merlot, become a member, and it's a free membership. Uh, you don't have to pay a thing. but it shows you exactly how to redesign your course so that you can utilize the materials in Merlot. And then I said, well, gee, if I'm gonna to have to do all of this work, well, where do I start? If you have the entire world as your library to literally pull any kind of free resource that you want, then it's like, well, how do you go through all that material and discover what's most important. Before I go into Merlot and kind of give you a mini demonstration of Merlot, let me just tell you a little bit about it. There's over 70,000 free open uh, online materials accessible to you. So I'm a marketing prefer, a professor, so I already know that if I do a, a, do a, a filter, I don't have to worry about the 70,000 pieces of literature to go through, but there's a significant number of materials to look at. So from going from a regular textbook that my students were paying two and three hundred dollars, literally for one textbook, and going to zero, zero free information, I said, so how do you find the right textbook information so that I can employ that in the classroom? So I'm going to take you on a tour in just a moment, but let me tell you, give you a little bit of data about uh, Merlot. And that is uh, 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 4,600 free open e-textbooks. So it's like, OK. So online textbooks, my students, all they have to do is just download a link that I provide to them. Now, in my current class that I'm teaching uh, with the, uh, the open educational resources, students are not paying anything for uh, the textbooks that I'm using, but I'm using four textbooks rather than one textbook. Now, why am I using four textbooks? The beauty of Merlot, I can pick and choose whatever I want to borrow to put in my class, and so I use select chapters from all four textbooks. So only the chapters that are applicable to the learner, that's what I'm going to use. In a regular uh, textbook that students uh, would have to purchase through a, a publisher for the most part, if there's 21 chapters, I feel like I have to uh, uh, assign all 21 chapters so they can get their money's worth. I just don't want to skip any chapters because I feel like if you're going to spend two or $300 on a textbook 
And if I know as a professor that I really want only maybe 15 of those chapters, but because I've, I had my students spending all that money, well, it's not fair to them, so I end up teaching things that I really don't want to teach that's not necessary for the students. So the beauty of Merlot is that you get to pick and choose what you want. So let's just take a brief little, a, a brief little tour, and that is we're just going to go. I'm a marketing professor, so anything that I want that has to deal with marketing, subject specific, I can find it right here. I just go do a word search, I click on marketing, and you see right to the leisure here, you see all of the wonderful, uh, there's, there's materials here, there's memberships, and I'm gonna go in some of these links in just a few seconds, but they make it very easy. It's intuitive to go to Merlot, pick out what you want. Everything that I do usually is, has to do with business. And so I'll click in there, and it's like, a, it's like going to a candy store. You can get just about anything you want. And so the other thing is that there's over 300 new materials being submitted to Merlot every single month. So I can always have the latest, the greatest, and the most up-to-date information possible using Merlot. Now, this is something I never thought about when I used to start teaching, uh, the, the I started the, using this, these uh, materials two years ago, okay? So I'm brand new at this. And so it was very, very difficult for me to let go of what I knew and going into new territory. But now that I'm here, I will never go back. I will never go back to the way that I used to teach because now my students are getting the benefit of a lot of wonderful material at no cost. The other thing. Let's see, uh, let me just move on here. So you can click on what I normally like to do. Let me just uh, increase the slide real quick. If you notice, you see date modified. I always look for the most up-to-date modifications that I can find. So for example, okay, here's global, uh, the global edge. I can actually go there and say, okay, this author uh, has modified or this particular uh, information has been modified recently. So now what I can do, I can go click in there, just hypothetically click in there, and I can actually see what's, oh, they're not giving me access. That's okay. <laughs> I'll come back to them later, okay? Don't worry, I'll be back, okay? I will be back. But at the end of the day, when, when you, you, you should be able to go to course material and be able to see exactly what's going on. And what I can do right now, I can bookmark this. I, I'll be back, okay? I will be back to this particular, uh, this particular uh, link here, but I can bookmark it for later. So if it's down or not available at the time that I want it, I go back later and I check it out. So that's one thing that we can do. Let, let's take a look at some other things. Let me decrease over to uh, the, the Back to the, uh, the sidebar, okay. So you can go uh, filter by discipline. You can filter by uh, just whatever discipline you're in. But then what I really love is that the type of materials that I want. So I don't have to worry about going through a whole lot of materials without necessarily knowing what, I, what I'm going for. So it's not a fishing expedition. I know what I want to, to do. So I can actually click on saying, okay, I want some case studies in my marketing area. Just click on case study, and what it will do is give me a bunch of case studies, and then what I will end up doing is uh, making sure I, I uh, do more filtering, and that is to say, okay, put marketing in there. And then I can get case studies for marketing, up-to-date case studies that I can actually use in my class. Okay, let me move on. I just want to talk about members. There's members from all around the world. We have, uh, Merlot has about 140,000 members that, you know, it's a free membership, 140,000 members. There's over 500 members right here. You might even see some people you know, right? Tell me, just raise your hand if you see someone you know. I'm just, oh, there's, oh boy, I'm making hits already. Oh, oh boy, this is wonderful. Right here, your community. So you have your community, oh, there's Dr. Combs. <laughs> there he is, right there. And if I really want to know more about Dr. Combs, I'm gonna do this, Dr. Combs. 
I can just click on his profile. Hopefully, he will not deny me this. OK. Oh, good. He did not deny me. But I can go into his profile. If he's a professor of marketing, I will be interested in knowing Dr. Combs or who he is. And I can say, OK, let me just see. He's from San Jose State. He actually works here in, um, in Thailand as well at one of the major prestige universities I see. Uh, I can actually go to his materials. I can actually see uh, uh, various other information that he has, but also his interest and skills, his history, publications. I can just go, it goes on and on. Now, here's the beauty. If you're not familiar with Merlot, or if you feel like, well, where do I start? I would say start browsing and then see who you know. And if there's someone that you know or someone you might know of, make a connection with that person. Make it easy for yourself. Ask them what their experiences are. Ask them how they use Merlot. And then that can literally take you straight to the point. They can tell you what works. They can tell you what, what uh, probably didn't work best for them. So that can be very, very helpful. Let me move on. There's learning communities. So excuse me, learning exercises and also learning communities. But let me just say learning exercises. We're talking about student engagement. How do you engage students in the classroom? So there's plenty of materials that you can see on this sidebar based on discipline that you can actually go through a whole filtering process and you can see what works for your students. And remember, here's something that, uh, that Jerry has said many, many times and I really get this. He says, teach people, not information. So if you're just going to go for the information, then we're going to roll back the clock. It's like me going back 35 years ago when I first started teaching, and my department chair would give me a textbook and say, go teach your students. Now it's different. Now I think about the students, and we know my students have a lot of different things going on. So I think about the students, and I select the materials that's best for my students. Let, let, I'm going to move on because I, I realize we're, moving, uh, uh, we're running out of time, and so I want to uh, make sure we get to other very important aspects of what we're doing. And so again, there's course materials, and you can just check this out. I know you brought your computers because I remember reading something, bring your computer. I would actually go into merlot.org and check out Merlot for yourselves. And at the very end, let me just say this now because we won't have time to go back. If you decide that you're interested in Merlot and you want to become a member of Merlot, remember it's what? Free. Okay, say that again. Free. free. And so you want to, to check it out and you know you can't beat free stuff to give your students. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next. Let's go to... Okay, I'm going to show you just briefly how I use Merlot in my class. In my, uh, my class. So here's the thing. My students were failing. They're not failing anymore. And as a result of going through the course redesign using Cool for Education, using Merlot and getting all the wonderful information, I completely changed what my class looks like. So I'm using the LMS called Canvas. This is what inside of my class looks like, and this is for fall. Uh, this is for my fall class. It's not, hey, this is what I love about Merlot. I, I literally set my class up using the Merlot uh, uh, course e-portfolio, creating my course. I have my course fully developed for the fall, and in California, it's just, we're in the summer months. And so my fall course doesn't start until, until, um, until uh, what? September? No, it, it okay. starts in August, uh, August 21st. But my course is ready to go for the entire semester. And I don't have to do a whole lot of work because I've already put 100 hours plus setting my course up. So my course is ready to go. So let me just tell you this. This is how I, 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 I've done uh, my course to make it palatable to the students. I keep it easy as one, two, three. Step one, I tell them what to do. Okay, I welcome them to the course, and I have, a, here's a part of the, um, 
the, the online presence. So whether a student comes to my class the first day at midnight or they come at one o'clock in the afternoon or nine o'clock in the morning, the first thing they do, they see me. And I'd like to welcome you to the study of marketing. In this particular course, you're gonna learn. Uh-oh, I just wanna turn that down marketing. a little bit. You're gonna learn that everything around you has some kinds of marketing implications. So what I like to do is. Okay, so that is just one. I just try to welcome them. And what I do, if you notice, I'm dressed casually here. Because the students in California, I won't say in the US because I, will be, I won't be telling you the truth, OK? But in California, we're pretty casual. And students expect, my students, my millennial students, as I said, I had to, I had to literally teach people, not information. So I had to look less intimidating. This might intimidate my students okay. if I'm dressed up and have on my suit. Now, 35 years ago, I, I wouldn't leave home without my jacket and my suit, and I'm all dressed up, and I expected my students to do the same thing, but students are different now. So my students want me to kind of look like them, although I can't look like them, but they want me to be approachable, okay? They, they, they want to see me as someone that's easy to talk to, someone that's approachable, and someone that's kind of fun. So what I've, I've done, I call myself Dr. E on campus, because that's the cool name. They like the cool <laughs> Dr. Easter. And so uh, I call myself Dr. E. But back to uh, going, so I, I give them the welcome, and they're able to see that. I hold their hand, because students that were not passing the class, they said, I don't know. I get online. I don't even know what I'm doing. I get lost. So I keep it as simple as what? One, two, three. Thank you. OK. So again, everything's one, two, three. Uh, tell them how to navigate. Don't assume because they're millennials, they understand technology. That was the first thing I used to think, oh my gosh, my students are going to know more than me. Oh my gosh, that I was wrong. They did not know as much as I thought they knew. Now, they know Facebook. They know Instagram, they know all the social media, but they did not know the course LMS. They did not know Canvas, so I had to teach them that. Um, the, uh, the course modules, and so I have everything. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna uh, just kind of briefly go through this, but I give them that this is the orientation before the class starts, how to navigate. After they meet with me, uh, meet Dr. Easter and they do the things I've asked them to do in the video. I have them to do an exercise. Now this is where student engagement comes in because it doesn't make sense to put a bunch of information online if you don't know if they're looking at this. So I tell them, look at the video because at the end of that video I tell them they have to do a certain step to get credit. So I know who's looking at the video and I know who's not looking at the video. Okay, step two. I like, read me first. I'm letting them know everything. This is how I want the format for papers. So again, we, we, I, I, I spent a lot of time in Merlot getting a lot of free information and free textbooks and everything else, but I want them to go through the process very systematically, uh, getting them into online discussion groups. That's the student engagement with each other. Mm -hmm. Very, very important. Get the students to talk to each other online. And they feel like, they have friends 24-7. OK, let me move on to step three, technical requirements. I go through every little detail before they even do one lick of course uh, information, of course reading. Now, one thing that I use that's really new for us at San Jose State, I use an online proctoring system called ProctorU. If you teach online, how do you know that the students are actually doing what they're supposed to do when they're taking a test? I can't see them. There's a lot of other uh, technologies and, and software that you can use to look at students while they're taking a test, but I use a live proctoring, uh, a live proctoring service called ProctorU where a person literally, is it, they can deal with students from around the world, any time zone or whatever it is, but they are watching the students while they're taking an exam. So I'm virtually there with the students. I don't have to worry about if they have their friend taking the exam because there's someone watching them. I don't have to worry about any academic integrity issues. So that is covered. 
The, um, let me move on. So now, first, they're just now starting the class, module one. Now, I keep it real simple, everyone. Every module looks exactly the same. Mm. So when students come into my online class, and this is different than my, my, pre, uh, my pre-redesign course. My original course, it wasn't like this. Mm -hmm. But my online course, everything looks the same. There is a module video because, again, you have to be able to meet students where they are. And the students need to see my face all the time. They click on it. They get to see Dr. E. The other thing, step-by-step -step instructions and what they need to do, and then I have a module description. Now, the module description is very important because the student knows that when they go into this module, they know exactly what they need to know to do well. I want students to pass my class. This course is designed for students to pass. Now, of course, there's always going to be the students that's not going to want to do the work whether you give it to them for what, for free, they don't even want the free stuff. They're just there. And so I don't, I can't worry about those students, but I try to set the course up so the students know exactly what the expectations are. Uh, the learning outcomes. Now, this is really important. When you're setting your course up, if you're going to redesign your course, you've got to think in terms of learning outcomes. My students know, and let me just make this bigger right here, we have a course learning outcomes and we have a class learning outcomes are two different. Mm -hmm. So the course, excuse me, the, there's a program, there's the course learning outcomes and then there's the individual class learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. The students know that everything is going to be aligned. So the students know that at the very end of this, uh, this particular module, they'll be able to define marketing, they're going to be able to do certain things and I tell the students what I'm giving them to achieve these learning outcomes. I'm giving them a reading assignment, I'm giving them a discussion, I'm giving them a video cases, and I'm also giving them a quiz. They know exactly what's going to happen before they do anything. Now, some students need more help. And so to deepen their knowledge, I give them more information. So let me go right back again to the very beginning, and then I'm going to turn it over to Carol after I just talk briefly about the outcomes. Okay. Let me just say this. Here's a module. There's the readings like I talked about. There's the assignments. There's additional resources, and there's everything in between. And again, all the modules look exactly the same. I only have seven modules. The seven module students have two weeks to complete the information in the modules. Now that takes, that's a lot different than the week to week class that I taught for 14 weeks in years past. Very, very different. Let's move on to the next. So let me just sh uh, briefly show you the outcomes of the students taking the pre-course redesign and the students that took the actual uh, redesign. So let's move on to that particular just going to, okay, we're going to just fast forward to, there you go. Okay, so let's just take a look here. Uh, the the pre-redesign is in the red. In the blue. Uh, excuse me, in the blue, I'm sorry. Okay. Pre-redesign in the blue. Before students, uh, uh, before I redesigned my course, mm -hmm. we had no A's in the class. And I was thinking, the, is the work that hard? What's going on? How come I can't get students to, to I mean, how come students aren't making A's? But we know the, the issues. Then we had a, a significant number of C's in the class. And again, we had the, the, uh, the, the D, F's, and W's. After I redesigned the course, and let me just say this. When I redesigned the course, the entry of uh, students wanting to take the course changed dramatically. When the students saw that they had to really do some work and that they were required to do certain things, almost half the students dropped my class. I'm like, oh my gosh, why are you going to drop my class? I put all this work into designing this course. But here's the beauty of it, is that after the students uh, took the class, we have, you see the A's. We got, students started making the grades. There's more A's. Um, there's more Bs, there's, we have a better distribution. And of course, we have the students that are just, you can do anything you want, they're just not gonna pass no matter what. You can't worry about that. Let's move on to the next. And so we can compare the students passing, the pre-redesign, 
Fewer students passing the pre-redesign, post-design, more students passing the class, thus graduating on time. And then we have our non-passing rates right there. Okay, so here's a student testimonial. This lady works at Google. And she's, gonna, and she's a working person. She fits all the demographics that we talked about. She's taking care of grandma, grandpa, and everybody in between. But here's what she has to say about the course that she, uh, my course, after she had completed it. Hi, everybody. My name is Jane Galvin. I'm a student at San Jose State. My major is in business with a concentration in human resources and a minor in psychology. I am only actually going to school part-time at the moment as I'm also a working professional. I'm a staffing program consultant at Google, so I stay very busy. And this semester I'm enrolled in uh, Dr. Easter's online marketing class. I like this class for a number of reasons. Um, well, first of all, the book is free, and you can't beat that, so thank you, Dr. Easter. Oh, you're um, beyond that, I, I really appreciate the way the class is structured. I think it's laid out nicely. It's very user-friendly. There's no ambiguity of what's expected, and it's just it's pretty straightforward, so I really appreciate that. Um, I like the communication that's really encouraged in the class. Not only is there a discussion board to where we need to answer questions, but we're encouraged to look at other students' responses, agree, disagree, and really get that communication going. Um, she also makes herself available live, so if we have any comments, questions, or concerns about the course or the material, we can have that discussion. Um, so I really like the way this is laid out. I think, I think classes like this can really set students up for a lot of success. Um, not only in marketing, but I also think it can help across the board. Um, as, I go, as I grow closer and closer to graduation, I'm having a rougher time getting the classes that I need. So the concern of whether or not I can graduate from San Jose State has become a concern. Um, there is a lot of motivation in enrolling in San Jose State, um, but being able to get the classes a student needs in order to complete their program, I think therein lies a lot of the success in making sure that students can walk away a graduate. Um, so thank you, Dr. Easter, for putting all of the efforts that you have into the online class. It's, I think it's really setting me up for success here and looking forward to the rest of the semester, so thanks so much. You're welcome. Yep. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, it's all about student feedback. You want to be able to uh, really be able to listen to your students and give them what they need. Like Jane said, uh, after the redesign of the course, uh, she was able to excel in the classroom as well as in her job, et cetera. Uh, and I'm sure that her job is very tough and she's very busy all the time. Um, but for myself at Chabot College, which is a junior university, uh, we prepare students to go to San Jose State University. Uh, we prepare students to go to the bigger colleges. So it's some kind of uh, two-year institution. So it's a two-year college. Um, and I teach graphic design, a multitude of technology and creative courses. Um, and my students came to me and said, uh, hey, uh, and I, I go by Carol, that's fine, because she's already Dr. E. I'm, I'm just Carol. Uh, I go, hey, uh, you know, Carol or Professor, um, if you don't mind, I really, really love the way you teach our technology in our classroom, um, but I've been looking for some other materials, like on YouTube or somewhere else, and I just can't find the way you explain it. Um, to me. So um, I teach uh, InDesign or Adobe products, if you guys are familiar, uh, like Photoshop and things like that. And uh, I said, you know what, I'm going to try my best. I'm going to see what I can do to create those uh, resources for you. So whenever I get a frequently asked question or someone to ask me, um, hey, uh, can you re-explain something? I'm sure you guys have uh, similar experiences and, hey, can you re-explain this? I want to hear it again. Um, that's where I have a, a YouTube channel now. I actually got a YouTube channel uh, set up for my students. Um, so whenever I hear that they have another question, I actually am able to provide them those resources. They can review it as fast as they want, as slow as they want, on any time, on the train. 
um, going and coming to work, um, and that'll be available to them 24-7. Uh, uh, but in order to learn how to create those things, of course, I'm a graphic design teacher. I should know a little bit about technology, um, but I had to do some research as far as uh, what technologies I needed to use in order to create content for my students. Because uh, the other OERs that you'll find in Cool um, and Merlot are easy to find, of course, but sometimes your students want something from you. So uh, this is uh, a clip from my YouTube channel. So uh, here we go. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Hey guys, this is going to be a small tutorial about uh, using the colors from an image to create a color scheme that hopefully you can use um, everywhere else. So select the color palette from this image. So I'm going to go over to my toolbar and then get the color theme tool out. And that, if you don't have it revealed, it's going to be underneath the eyedropper tool. Um, but it looks So like I'm going to go ahead and click on my image now. So I've selected the color uh, theme tool. Boom. And what it's done is it's created a color palette. So I can go ahead and see colorful here, bright, and there's different kind of moods for the colors that they have chosen for us. And these are just simply like suggestions, um, but based off of your document. And if you are, you know, just looking for an easy way of finding some colors that you can use that are going to look good in your document. Um, these are going to be color palettes that are automatically pulled from this photo. And uh, those are the types of tutorials. I've chopped that one up quite a bit to uh, get to the gist of it for you guys. But uh, really what I'm doing is I'm creating something that should be easy to follow, uh, very small things about tools, and you can do it yourself no matter what discipline. Um, as you saw in the uh, previous um, uh, slides with my mother, uh, you were able to see her actually teaching her own canvas uh, classroom and you have you know her wearing a red shirt uh, that's actually using some of these softwares that I have available to you here um, not all of them are free but you can always work with your university in order to get a hold of them um, with recording editing and uploading those are the three main steps as to creating a process so you can create video content for your students. Um, so if you want to use QuickTime, that's what my mother uses for her screen captures. Screen capture simply means that you are taking a picture of your computer screen. Uh, the same thing goes with me. I use uh, ScreenFlow for the screen capture software because it has a lot of great materials uh, within it. You can actually edit it. And I have a little bit of a demonstration on how to do that or what features that uh, software has as well. And then um, after you get those things for editing, uh, you'll use um, any editing software you'd like to use. If you want to use uh, ScreenFlow, then it's all built in there for you. But I like to do those really cool intros and exits uh, for my videos. So that's why I use editing software on top of that. And uploading, of course, you can upload them anywhere. But I use YouTube because, as my mother said, you meet your students where they are. If they are on social media networks, um, you want to be right where they are so they don't have to log in and log out. Um, you don't want any access barrier. You want them to make sure that they can actually uh, see all of those contents. I do want to have a small call out for OBS. OBS is a software, I haven't really mentioned that, um, but OBS is open broadcasting uh, software. And what that means is I'm able to do live streams for my students. So I actually do blow by blows um, or complete walkthrough tutorials of how to create documents in my class or entire projects. Because it's a graphic design class, I need to do that. But I'm sure you could probably use it for any kind of live lecturing if you are any other discipline. I see that. So I'm just going to scrub through, this is a small video of how um, I'm able to create these uh, tutorials. This is my actual computer screen 
Um, and this is the document that, oh my gosh, this is what we're looking at right now, the uh, actual presentation that I've been working on uh, to show you guys today. Um, and you'll see that it's a screen capture program. At the very top, you can see that I've created, this is called a call out. A call out is uh, basically where you can get a zoomed in picture of your mouse and everything else, and everything else kind of fades into the background. So if you need to draw your students' attention to something, that's what ScreenFlow can do for you. Um, and also, if you want to, oh, let's see here. Um, this is the program ScreenFlow inside it. You can see that it is very similar to other editing software packages. Uh, it has uh, two lines, audio as well as video, where you can trim and edit your, clip, your clips. Um, as well as add more to it. Uh, this actually has a software feature where you can do a picture in picture, meaning that you can have the camera facing yourself as well as your, um, your desktop image. So that's something that's very, very nice. Uh, it also includes places where you can, uh, I use shapes in the software, you can add titles, but the reason why I use shapes is so I can hide my personal information as I use my own personal computer. Um, that's uh, always a good thing to do as well. Uh, and I also make sure that I use a a very good microphone or just even a medium good microphone um, with it because sound quality is important with these tutorials. Um, directly in ScreenFlow, and I'm not quite sure when it will pop up. Let's see. Ah, uh, yes, here. So um, right here you can see that you're able to upload directly from the ScreenFlow software into YouTube. So this is a uh, recording, editing, and uh, uploading solution all in one program. This is a paid software, I'm sorry about it, um, but uh, if you are interested in making sure that your tutorials are quick and easy, um, especially if you're teaching uh, technology courses, uh, this is uh, my recommendation. And it's really important to make sure that you can uh, be able to receive feedback from your students in order to uh, continue the education, to continue those uh, types of things where you can provide them the resources that they need. Uh, and that's really what OERs are about. Okay, so teaching presence, what does that mean? Whether you're teaching a regular uh, live class on ground or a blended class, also known as hybrid, or you're online, students need to feel like you're there. So how do you do that? It's the way you set up, the way you design your course. So you gotta be very selective. So you're gonna go into Merlot, you're going into course, where, wherever you go to get information. You have to say, how am I going to provide this information so that we can get the best engagement from the students? Extremely important. Your presence is very important, and it starts in the background. So you can't be present right now in your class if you haven't designed your class properly to get the presence. When I give videos or do, I provide videos in my, in my class, the first thing I think about, okay, first of all, the, the videos have to be short. Students are not gonna spend 30 minutes watching a video. I'm sorry, it's not gonna happen. The data shows that even when you do a lecture, Students are gonna spend anywhere from four to seven minutes engaged in that lecture material and they're gonna click straight out. Now they're gonna go swimming, they're gonna to go to the mountains, they're gonna they're going do all kinds of stuff. So how can you get them engaged and keep them engaged? Keep it short, I like to do the one, two, three step, keep it real super simple and make sure that everything looks the same for the students. So it's the structure of the class, Behind the scenes, what happens, all the things that we've talked about so far, you got to think about the student first. Teach people, not materials. It's very important. If you keep that in mind, you'll start thinking about, okay, I wanna, I'm going to use four different textbooks. I think about this. So am I going to give them all four textbooks? No. What am I going to give them? Here's a test, you guys. Somebody said it. Chapters. There's two people that get you, get, you get the first pins at the very end. I have a gift for you, okay? So you make sure you collect your, your gifts. So here's the thing. 
You select only the materials that's appropriate for what you're teaching. So when it comes to aligning the learning, we got to think about that. Backup, are we okay on time? Okay, so you got to think about all these things up front before you release your class. The other thing is determining uh, the content online. I'm always thinking about this. Discussion groups, for an example. That's a form of engagement, but you have to monitor how the students are engaging when they're talking to each other. So I have a prescribed rubric that I give to the students and say, okay, when you're doing online discussions with your colleagues, here's appropriate feedback that you give your colleagues, and I give them an example, and then I'll say, here's things that's inappropriate, and I give an example. So that when I grade them, and this is a lot of work, I tell you, if you do online discussions and you're grading the students on the discussions, it's a lot of work. But you know what? That comes with the, the territory. If you're going to redesign your course and you want to get engagement, you're just going to have to spend the time on task to ensure that the students are engaging properly. And then after a while, they get it. The, uh, the role of my role, I have to be there available. That teaching presence is very important. Teacher to student is important. Teacher to content is important. Student to student is important. All these different things I'm watching at all times. And then also, as Carol said, it's so important. Carol gives free information to the students, free resources to the student, but she designs her resources. I don't do that. But the number one thing, she listens to the students. When, I, when my students are asking me questions or if there's something that's not working and I get that information in the middle of the semester, by the next week, I'm going to change it. I'm going to update it. The other thing, there may be links in Merlot that you might use with a textbook or a video, and then all of a sudden you're saying, oh my gosh, that link isn't there. It was there last week. It's not there now. So what do you do? You have to just be ready to update your materials and then tell your students, hey, guess what? That was fun, wasn't it? Now we have the real information that you're looking for. And now the students, they forgot that you know, it was a mistake or it wasn't there and they're happy. Give them extra credit or whatever. Again, that's another form of engagement. OK, let's, educators must make his or herself present. The presence must be felt in the learning environment. It's so important. And this is for, comes from Dewey. I didn't invent this. I didn't create this. But at three different levels, content, pedagogy, as well as students themselves. So here's the content. Right here, we have the content. And so however you're going to deliver that, the content should be available to the students 24-7 on any kind of uh, device. This is me, and here's the students right there live on class. And you see me talking over there. And then again, student to student. So if you have these three different interactions going on in the classroom at all times, the students are going to love it. Students are absolutely love the, the teacher presence. Now, let me just make a, one disclaimer. When I say teacher presence, and I'm available to students 24-7, I tell my students in the syllabus, on weekends, I take a break. Please, please, if you send me an email over the weekend, that's my personal time, I promise you that I will get back to you first thing Monday morning. I let them know that. But what I've done, I actually built in videos that are pre, uh, they're pre-recorded, and I release them like at midnight on Saturday, again, uh, midnight on Sunday, and they said, oh, she's there. Oh my gosh, I can contact her. They love it. So they still feel like I'm there holding their hands. Another thing is really important. If you tell the students that you're going to get back to them within 24 hours, please do so. Because if you do not do that, the student feels lost. It's like this. When I came to Bangkok, first time, I've never been here before, and I look around, I was like, oh, Oh my gosh, this is another world, it's so different. But Dr. Combs, he met, met us at the, uh, at, at the hotel and he took us all around Bangkok. And I tell you, now I feel like there's someone that's holding my hand. I feel like I can't get lost because 
Dr. Combs is there, and you want that same kind of feeling for your students. Okay, the, here it is, the teaching presence interaction. So we have, uh, Carol, you want to get yeah, that real quick? Uh, so uh, with teacher presence, you know, um, in my own personal experience, uh, I actually teach on the ground as well as in the cl classroom. So say, for instance, I'll be able to create videos. Uh, I'll have them accessible for people 24-7. And then when I see them in class, after they've reviewed the content, uh, we can actually have a really great discussion. So it's really about making sure that as an instructor, I'm there for my students. I have the uh, content. Uh, let me just see here. The content um, that is acceptable uh, per uh, their learning experience. And then I'm able to uh, reach out to them. And this is the learner themselves. Um, and we'll be able to talk. Uh, I'll go ahead and actually receive that feedback loop. And it will happen over and over again uh, for that overall learning experience. So that's um, really great. So the learning experience is key to a successful online uh, course for me. Mm -hmm. Now, how do I do this? I, I take it into stages. So we're, we're, kinda, we're wrapping up everything that we've talked about so far. But I want you to really think about this. When you're going through Merlot, for an example, and there are 70,000 uh, pieces of material that you can choose from. There's over, what, uh, there's 140,000 professors that are out there, excuse me, uh, members, 54 prof 54,000 professors, 44,000 students, and I can go on and on with these numbers. That's overwhelming. Yes. So you have to think about this. Again, filtering everything that you're gonna do, but most important, think about when you're planning, I, I know what my students need in a marketing class, so I'm going only after the, that material that's going to help the student because I'm teaching what? I'm teaching people, not information. You guys got that? Yeah. So you can repeat it, okay? What is that? Oh, thank you, everybody. Okay. So there you got it. You got it. Thank you. So we're teaching people. So I always go back to, OK, what was the experience my students had last semester? Sometimes, I must admit, in one semester, I can say, oh my gosh, this class was wonderful. I read the student evaluations, and they loved everything about the class. I, I roll the class out again the following semester. I look at the student evaluations, and they're different. Why is that? I have to always kind of. I tweak my course, kind of change a few little things based on the students. I got to keep a careful eye of the students right from the very beginning. Any questions they may have, I need to start thinking about that. Again, it's all in the planning stages. Then you implement. Once you implement, you see what works, you see what doesn't work. And you may have to stop whatever's not working. You might have to stop mid-semester, and you might have to start all over again. And you have to go through the assessment process. Now, this is a, rec uh, re uh, a uh, recursive process. It's, it's something that's never ending. You're constantly assessing. You're constantly evaluating. You're constantly finding out what's working, what's not. I don't have the luxury that Carol has. And that is she creates a lot of free um, information for the students. You know where I go for my free stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Where do I go? I go to Merlot. They have every, it's my candy store. It's my educational candy store. So whatever I want, I can find it. I can find uh, 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 cases for the students. I can find just all kinds of things, videos. Now let me just give you one thing about Merlot that I had to learn on my own. When it comes to testing, you say, well, can you get test banks through Merlot? Do you guys want to know about that? Yeah. Yes or no? I want to hear a yes, a definite yes. yes. OK. You're got, you might find yourself a little disappointed. It's because if you're going to use four different uh, textbooks like myself, mm -hmm. not all of the authors that contribute their materials uh, link their uh, materials to the textbook, right. I mean, their, uh, to the test bank. Yes. So then what, what do I do? I go to my learning community and I find out what they're doing. I find out what they're using. And then sometimes I can borrow that. So for the, for the, the uh, cons, the things that may not work, the nice thing about it, 
If you keep digging in Merlot, you can find what does work. So I have a lot of wonderful test banks that I'm, I was able to get from some of my online uh, uh, colleagues in the community, and that works just fine in Merlot. But I had to discover that. I did not know that at first. I thought that if I, if I got a textbook, I'm automatically going to get all the supplements and everything else. So that's something to be mindful of. So implications. We're here already. The importance of technology for the next generation of teachers. Now, unlike my daughter, who's only been teaching for two years, she's doing a pretty good job. Don't you think so? Let's give her a round of a hand, everybody. Thank you so much. Now, the reasons why I say this is so important. She's brand new at teaching, but she has all this wonderful information provided to her as the, the forward thinking in, instructor or teacher. She has everything at her fingertips. So, and the only thing I had was what? What did my, I'm, this is another test, everyone. This is what you call um, uh, what uh, engagement at the conference, OK? <laughs> So there's student engagement, there's conference engagement. What did my, you like, to, you like to answer the question. This is a test question for you. What did my chair give me when I first started teaching? Just a textbook. They didn't tell me anything about, well, here's the cases, or here's learn exercises for the students. I had to figure all this stuff out on my own. But with Carol, Carol comes in with a whole new different skill set. Carol? Yes. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's funny how you point me out to be a millennial. I, I didn't know I'd be targeted like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, like uh, coming from uh, a background where I've had technology all my life, I have very similar experiences with my students, um, which means that I actually have to kind of keep up with them in a lot of ways because I know a lot of things for my, you know, my background in graphic design. But, you know, for them, they are doing so many new things, and I have to always be changing. So I have to keep up with them as well. Um, and I think it's important to uh, understand that I also teach uh, people that are baby boomers. Um, and if they're coming back to college uh, for the very first time in a long time to get their skills back uh, to uh, the workplace. So with that, you know, competence in technology uh, is a broad spectrum. I have some people that uh, email is new, uh, and they can be 16 years old. Um, but then also, I can have someone who has been, you know, uh, in the business industry, and they are running circles around uh, people uh, that are in my age group. So it's something to uh, really be aware of, um, and then also being open to change. Um, that's why. It was just one conversation with a few students that I had that uh, propelled me to get a YouTube channel going. And uh, it's been really, really rewarding in the classroom because they tell me all the time, oh, professor, you know, those videos that you have on the YouTube channel, I'm able to review them at any time I like. And it's really been able to help them uh, with the software packages. So. Uh, I think that that's the biggest thing. You want to make sure that you're not always stuck in the same way sometimes. Uh, you have to be more flexible sometimes. So, so as, as Dr. Marcus said earlier today, it's a paradigm shift. Things are never going to be the same. And I love, Dr. Marcus, your, uh, your title uh, about the education in an era of disruption. I mean, it's so, it's so timely because everything has changed. Yes. Everything is changing. And nothing's staying the same. And there's so much, uh, there's so much more that keeps coming out. Every, every time I think I have everything down to a science, there's a lot of new things. So we have to make sure that we know about the infrastructure. At San Jose State University, it feels really wonderful. We have the infrastructure for technology. All of my students that are in my online class get free uh, proctoring online. Now, a lot of the colleges don't offer that for free, but San Jose State, they provide the free proctoring. When it comes to the digital to, uh, divide, well, a lot of my students, if they couldn't afford a textbook, do you think they can afford an iPad? For sure they can afford that cell phone. They all have cell phones. <laughs> I, I don't know what happens, but they'll forego eating to have that, that iPhone or whatever. But many of them do not have computers. And so our school provides computers 
for the students to borrow, and they can have it for an entire year, This uh, the, the freshmen, and there's a lot of different uh, uh, rental places that doesn't cost anything. We like the free stuff at San Jose State University, so it doesn't cost the students um, any money at all. The educational technology, I have a whole team of people at San Jose State that work across the campus and also work individually with the professors. So if I have any issues or any problems, any questions, there's always someone there for me. It's almost like having an IT person just sitting next to you 24-7. I call on them just like, I like my students think they can call on me or whatever. <laughs> Collaborative learning. You want to cover yes, that? Um, with collaborative learning, um, you're able to uh, have that 24-7 access. Um, so with that, uh, I actually use a lot of modules and uh, group uh, exercises in my class. Uh, and I have them both online and in the classroom, as well as the uh, web tools that are available for us on uh, in Merlot, um, as well as uh, the conferencing. There's actually conferencing uh, software built in cool for ed as well. Uh, so you can actually have almost like a Google chat um, type of interface or a video chat type of interface. But uh, at Chabot College, we don't have, um, you know, the, uh, I guess, free um, ability to have like, I guess, uh, textbooks um, on iPads and things like that. What we do is we actually just have lab time. So with lab time, uh, we have Almost, I think, uh, all day, every day of the week, uh, there are computer labs that are available for every discipline that needs a computer um, with all of the software that they need. So they don't have to purchase anything. They don't have to uh, go out and borrow iPads or anything like that. They can just come to the lab uh, on campus and then use those things. So um, that is uh, really uh, rewarding, too, because I can go and meet them and help them uh, there as well. <laughs> yeah. So whatever web uh, tools that you uh, that works for your students, again, it's about students, not materials mm -hmm. at, uh, for the most part. But whatever tools work, that's what you want to use. Um, and just know your students, know what your campuses offer, and then try to integrate those. But I would encourage you to check out Merlot. And so if you really would like to check out Merlot, uh, it's merlot.org. And if you want to, it's su super simple to just uh, click in there. And if nothing, if you want to become a member, if nothing else, you can go and see what other people are doing in your discipline. And we'd like to thank you thank so you. much for participating in our presentation. Thank you very much. It's on. Okay. Hi, I'm Wan. I'm Hi, from Wan. University Putra, Malaysia in Malaysia. Um, thank you for your very interesting presentation. Um, may I ask about the your um, live uh, meetings with your students? Oh yes. Uh -huh. Was that um, uh, the like schedule in the semester, and uh, you're using the Canvas itself or using like app like Zoom? Okay, that's a good question. I once, uh, once a week I have what is called Live with Dr. E. So I have a particular time that students know that I'm live. So if you want to come and chat with me, I'm right there for you. And we can have that, that, uh, that online discussion or whatever. And they don't have to come, but they know that I'm available during that time. There are students that prefer to just talk with me via Zoom. And so Zoom is the, is, is the preferred uh, uh, way of connecting with the students. And that can be scheduled with the students. So some students that do not want to do the live with Dr. E, uh, they they uh, would just want to talk to me via Zoom. That's how I do it. Okay. There was a question up front, Howard. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentation, and it's very very interesting. And um, yeah, you mentioned a little bit about assessment and the test bank, right? Mm -hmm. um, may I ask you about how how you, do do you design your test bank online? I mean, students go online for their test or they do on, on their paper, or on okay. how you access this. Okay. Thank you. So uh, 
thank you. Okay, so the question was, uh, was about the test bank. Do I do it myself? Do I create that myself? And, and also, how do students actually get tested? Number one, I do create my own test bank, and I tell you, that takes a lot of time. So when I talk about spending literally hundreds of hours developing the course, I literally mean that, because everything has to be aligned. I have to align all of the questions so that it matches what the students are learning. Also, there are some text banks that are free that I borrow so that I can actually extract some of the questions that, might, uh, that I'm able to, um, to apply to the test. Now, how do I test the students? I use ProctorU. That's an online proctoring system. And so the students go into Canvas, they click on the exam, and then when they click on the exam, it takes them to the, um, to the actual test. The, they, the students also have to, uh, to register for ProctorU, and then ProctorU will make sure that they go through a whole process to make sure that there's no contamination in the, uh, learn, in the uh, testing environment, that there's no notes uh, uh, posted on their walls and things like that. And so it's like a teacher standing in front of the students. And so it's literally online, but they go through Canvas to get to ProctorU, and ProctorU is the, uh, the, the live online uh, proctoring system that, that watch the students during the time that they take the exam. Now I give the students from just say uh, 9 o'clock in the morning till midnight to take the exam. And I give them a 90 minute exam so they can, we know that these students work or they're taking care of grandma and grandpa and they're doing a lot of things. So I give them enough time to be able to take the test all throughout the day. So if they're, if, if they're working during the day, full time or whatever, they take it at night. If they're working at night, they take it during the day. Does that answer your question? Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. E. You're welcome. And Carol. Okay. Was illuminating, very interesting. Okay. Um, do you call this a MOOC? Excuse me? Oh. No, this would not be a okay. MOOC. Uh, this this uh, course is, is literally uh, maximum 45 students uh, per class. And so what I do, I integrate, I have three of the same courses and I put them all under the same roof, so to speak. So I actually release this course for three different classes at the same time. But this is not a MOOC, this is far from a MOOC. I have a long ways to go before I think about a MOOC. Yeah, this is a total redesign of a regular stand in the classroom for an hour and 45 minute course to now taking it online and doing a lot more online than I'd ever done live in the class. And uh, let me just say one thing. Students that are really quiet in the classroom, yes. they will talk my ear off yes. online. They talk, they engage because they feel that it's okay. It literally break down barriers, break down walls, and students will interact a lot more. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other questions? You know, we do encourage you to uh, sign up for Merlot. Again, it's totally free, it takes five minutes. All you gotta do is put your name in, you're in, that's it and you have access to all the material. I use it as well. I teach my classes online, online. in the same online. department. Yeah. So all the things that you've heard are things that you know we are doing, and it's really wonderful. So I wanted to thank all of you for coming, and also thank our presenters for a very wonderful presentation today. They have volunteered. If any of you want to set up Merlot right now, you can just come up here, and they'll help you do it on, on your uh, computer or on your account. Nothing to it. Happy to do that. So I think we're ready for a coffee break. And again, thank you very much to our presenters for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.